the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, Olayemi Kadoso, has said for Nigerian banks to effectively play their intermediation role in the one trillion naira economy. The Bola Chinobud administration is targeting. The Apex Bank will be directing the financial institutions to increase their capital. Kadoso, who said this in a keynote address he delivered at the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria. 58th Annual Bankers Dinner and Grand Finale of the Institute's 68th Anniversary, heard in Lagos, pointed out that with right policy measures, the country can overcome the obstacles hindering economic growth and pave the way for progress and prosperity. He also assured Nigerians that despite concerns about the current state of the country's economy, the challenges are not insurmountable. The assurance by Cardoso came on the same day the National Bureau of Statistics disclosed that Nigeria's gross domestic product GDP growth rate increased to 2.5% year-on-year in real terms in the third quarter of 2023, compared to 2.51% in the preceding quarter. Joining us now on the morning show as we take a look at the APS Bank's directive is Professor Shegun Ajibola, former president, Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria. Good morning, Professor Ajibola, and thank you very much for joining us on the morning show. Good morning. Well, Professor Ajibola. The moderator. Yes, I'm sure you had my uh, introduction. The uh, governor of the Central Bank I spoke at well. the uh, CIBN uh, 58th General Annual Meeting. And he has made a number of pro proposals. The Chinubu administration wants to come up with a $1 trillion economy. Two, he's saying banks must recapitalize and shore up their capital base. Three, he said the CBN that he inherited engaged in quasi-financial activities, not the purview of the CBN, and that is going to return the CBN to his uh, uh, orthodox uh, uh, ways. Uh, well, what do you think of some of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, proposals that he has put on the table? How feasible are they? Do you think this is just rhetoric or an action plan that Nigerians can uh, be confident about? Okay, thank you. Um, to start with, the President has unfolded his plan to move the Nigerian economy <coughs> to a $1 trillion GDP economy. And from all that we can see, the President is so passionate about this. He's showing commitment, he's showing leadership. Uh, we can at least see how many bilateral and multilateral talks have taken place since May. So we can therefore see a clear roadmap backed by commitment at the presidency level. But for this to happen, banking is often defined as the commanding height of any economy. And there is a positive correlation between the state of the banking industry and the state of an economy, they move almost in the same direction. And there is a causality factor. The more healthy the banking system is, the more healthy an economy will be, and vice versa. One of those things that define the state of health of the banking system is the strength of the capitalization of the industry. Now, we've seen for quite a period of time now, the shift in the value of our currency, especially between 2005, <clears throat> when the last capitalization exercise was carried out, and now, about 18 years. As at the time the last capitalization of 25 billion was carried out, the value of the Naira 
was just a bit over a hundred naira compared with about um, 800 naira that we have today. So there has been erosion in terms of real value. There has been erosion in the level of capitalization of banks. Therefore, calling for a refit of the adequacy of the capitalization level as we have it today. Dr. Olayeme Caduso was right in saying that the, uh, the time is due to revisit the capitalization. And uh, he was silent about what figure? He was silent about the time frame, which will be the details later. But let me step back a bit to <coughs> mention where we got things wrong in 2005, which some of us uh, pointed out then. 25 billion was imposed as minimum capital base for all banks. It, there was, it, it was absolutely unnecessary to make such a pronouncement that will, 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 will create a sense of equality among banks. All banks need not be of the same size. So some of us can fast for some categorization then, but it never happened. Until about 2011, about six years after, when that was revisited by the uh, succeeding governor of Central Bank. And we now have three levels, international, national, <clears throat> and regional, with different levels of capitalization. But before then, the 2005 exercise created a lot of problems. Unholy alliances, marriages of inconveniences, pollution of uh, corporate culture, some fine brands were lost. Some good customers had problems. Some depositors, oh, depositors were saved, but some shareholders lost out. The economy did not benefit, eventually, as we saw in 2008, 2009, a crisis. So for such an exercise to come up now, there are certain basic rules that must be observed. The first one is stakeholder engagement. We all are stakeholders in the economy. So for us to key into, that is as an industry now, banking industry, to key into the passion and commitment of President Inubu, then we must as stakeholders ensure that everything is OK with the banking industry as the commanding height of the economy. So there must be stakeholder engagement. Who are the stakeholders in banking and finance in Nigeria? So then there must be enough time frame clearly defined capital uh, categorization of the capital level as we have the three tiers as are today. But let me also add this. The level of capitalization of a bank, uh, you know, banks are mere managers of liabilities. So they intermediate between what we call the surplus funds unit and deficit funds unit. And that is why the capital adequacy ratio is even very low compared with the size of a bank. And that as today, I think it's 12.5%, which means you only need to have one over eight of your total, what we use to call balance sheet, your total financial position as your own stake as shareholders in a bank. 87.5% will come from outsiders. And when you look at even the loan portfolio of a bank, which offers between 60 and 70%, you will see that most of what the activities of banks are dictated via the funds mobilized from others. However, you need strong capitalization because your capital is long-term, stable, unchangeable funds available to you. So you can deploy that to some fixed requirements that like you want to expand your reach, you want to spend on information technology, you want to 
acquire some fixed assets and so on and so forth, you need strong capitalization to remain a very strong going concern. So that is why we need that. So I think it is an exercise that is due, but due caution must be taken so that we don't rush into an exercise. Like I said, 25 billion was pronounced and there was no, no question and answer, no contribution from any stakeholder, and the uh, banks just uh, went back. We we're running into so many kinds of uh, mergers, acquisitions, and so on and so forth, okay. racing for time. Okay. And okay. at the end of the okay, day, sir. Prof, Prof, the industry. Prof, I would like to was ask never, you. Was never better for it. Prof, I would like to ask you a couple of questions because you have institutional memory, which is something lacking. Prof, do you know the conversations yes. that led to the one hundred and eighty-seven million dollar threshold, which is like the twenty-five billion threshold, as a then? when that recapitalization okay. was first done. Can you talk us through the conversations around there and why that 25 billion was fixed? Secondly, can you also talk us through the problems yeah. that we had with the banks then, which was a proliferation of banks, then we had close to about 80 banks, which was the proliferation of banks and lack of the quality of those banks that could champion or push forward our economy. And can you also give us an idea of a range that you probably will hazard a guess that capitalization should be now? <coughs> well, very interesting questions. As at that time, nobody would question the desirability of recapitalization in, 20, in 2005. Nobody. No sincere industry stakeholder who question it. We had 89 banks, and some of them just uh, living on foreign exchange uh, businesses and so on and so forth, not in a position, lacking the capacity to go into core banking activities. So in fact, it was overdue. So the then leadership of both the industry and the country was completely in the right frame of mind to have called for recapitalization in 2005. I mean, banking business was just uh, uh, becoming uh, wishy-washy at that time, with 2 billion uh, capitalization level, 6 billion, 10 billion. Uh, nothing could be achieved as at that time. So nobody is talking about lack of desirability. And you know what? Banks were being enabled to be able to can do some big ticket transactions on behalf of their customers. Unlike uh, a major name, multinational in the country, wanting to pursue certain transactions, 10 banks, 20 banks, 30 banks will gather together under what we call loan syndication to be able to uh, see such transaction through. But with the recapitalization, the banks regain that capacity to be able to handle certain big ticket uh, transactions. So those were the argument. Nobody could fault it. It's the process that led to certain on, uh, unintended consequences. So if the process had been handled in a much different way than it was, I talk about ca categorization, banks needed not to have been of the same size. So the recapitalization that was done in 20, 2011, if I'm not mistaken, ought to have, to have come during the recapitalization exercise in 2005. So all the uh, only alliances, uh, abuse of corporate governance uh, practices, uh, pollution of corporate culture that we saw because of the horrid Magyar's acquisition and so on and so forth. Some very good, very, very vibrant brands, but small in size that would have been able to mobilize maybe 10 billion and be in category uh, C or 15 billion in category uh, B were lost. So those were the uh, unintended consequences, which also did not help the position of the industry. So that's what we are saying that now that we are thinking of another exercise, let's avoid the mistake of the past. Let's do it in the finest of manner so that the benefits accruable from such a recapitalization exercise will be available to the country. There will be value addition from such an exercise, which will be the case. Now, as to figure 
Uh, no, nobody can just start dropping figures now. Uh, it could be reduced to a scientific exercise. If, for example, you ask me, okay, it was about 100 and something to dollar that time. Now, it has uh, moved about seven times. So if we are talking about capitalization now, then multiplies 25 by seven. I think that would be a scientific exercise. But will, will that be easy in reality? Walking the talk, going outside there, if you multiply 25, even by six. Now, if you have for 100 uh, uh, billion, if you have for 150 billion, the environment we are, or are we opening up to foreign investors? The environment we are, can we mobilize such? So I think that is part of the questions that will be asked through painstaking evaluation of the whole exercise and coming out with a template. So uh, uh, spare me that, uh, that uh, agony of dropping any figure. I don't think that would be, let, 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 let there be thorough evaluation. Let there be so many issues that will be put on the table. And at the end of the day, like I said, engagement with the stakeholders, uh, and we have so many of them. We have body of bank CEOs. We have the Chartered of Bankers of Nigeria. It's a uh, secretariat. We have the Bankers Committee. We have a business uh, community. Uh, Manufacturing Association of Nigeria. We, we, we have a, a professional body. Chartered of Bankers of Let all, uh, they, we have the government, Federal Ministry of Finance, the presidency. Let all stakeholders sit down, look at the facts, and ask ourselves not only the figure that is desirable, the figures that are attainable, given the state of the economy. But like I said, the, uh, Dr. Lai Mekaruso was right in saying that, the central bank is right in saying that this exercise is now due for consideration. Okay, Prof. One of the things I raised in the introduction. I, 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 I can't remember if there are some other questions. I think there were some other questions. Please help me repeat the question so that I can no, okay. no, Prof, I think we had sorted it out. You had, you had answered most of them. I raised a question about Cardoso's criticism of, his, uh, of the central bank under Emifiele. He said okay. that the central bank strayed okay, okay. away from its core function and was engaged in quasi-financial activities in aviation, in agriculture, in housing, and that what he intends to do is to bring the, uh, the central bank to its core function of ensuring financial stability and focusing on monetary policy. Do you have a word of defense uh, for Mr. Mifili? Because I recall that the fiscal side, the misalignment between the monetary side and the fiscal side probably was what put pressure on the central bank to begin to take on some of those challenges, and also the peculiarity of the times, COVID-19, war in uh, Ukraine. But what's your take on that? Uh, uh, the position of the governor <coughs> of a central bank anywhere in the world is a professional calling. And central banking is a product of a statute. There are rules and regulations. So you must, there are, there are three things that will define who you are in occupying a sensitive position, not only as central bank governor, if for the critical positions in the economy. Number one is your capacity to deliver the skills and expertise, your knowledge, your experience, your background, would define your capacity to understand the demands of that office. Number two is the will, the willpower, the courage to do the right thing. So number three is your integrity and goodness of character to stand by what is right. So these three things combined would define the sources or otherwise of an occupant of such a sensitive position. Now, coming straight to your question. Like I said, central banking is a product of statute. Uh, put simplicity, there are five traditional functions of a central bank anywhere in the world. Whether you are talking about uh, 
uh, financial services authority, whether you are talking about a Federal Reserve Bank, whether you are talking about Bank, People's Bank of China, whether you are talking about Central Bank of Ghana, five statutory functions. Number one, you issue currency notes and coins. Number two, you are banker to government. Number three, you are bankers bank. Number four, you are lenders of last resort. Number five, you manage foreign exchange for the country. Those are five traditional functions. Now, the second leg is the developmental functions. The developmental functions vary depending on the state of an economy, but everything must be regulated within the enabling law. And as a lawyer, I know that the extant law as of today is CBN Act 2007. CBN Act 2007 imposes on a central bank the maximum amount that you can advance to a government, which used to be 5% of the previous year's revenue, increased to 15% by the ninth uh, National Assembly. There was no way a statute would have envisaged Central Bank of Nigeria lending directly to farmers, lending directly to manufacturing, lending directly to anybody whatsoever. Because a central bank lacks the capacity, either in terms of geographical spread, either in terms of human resources, <coughs> to monitor borrowers directly from them. And uh, to make it worse, uh, it's uh, like lending to agriculture. Agriculture is one of the most difficult, agricultural law is one of the most difficult to manage, pursue, and recover. It, especially in this part of the world, where however well-intentioned the farmers may be, the borrowers may be, there are factors beyond their control that may frustrate business plans, that may make some goals, some targets unrealizable, that may make it difficult for them to pay back any loan. Even to banks that police them on a daily basis, talk like of a central bank that is not even available to monitor what is happening. So it was a mis misadventure to go into that, either to agree, to manufacturing, to uh, Nollywood, to, to others. Then to now compound the situation, NISA Microfinance Bank emerged to, comp to compete with the uh, few micro licensed microfinance bank still breathing. And if you recall, the NISA National Assembly was even directing NISA Microfinance Bank to write off about 280 something billion that was advanced by that microfinance bank. Why? Because the wrong template was applied. And that is money coming from the system. So, Central Bank had no business going directly into that. What if you are talking about helping, helping agree? But let, let me also say, oh, <clears throat> let me say this. The whole idea of providing a sort of concessionary loans or other incentives to critical sectors like agriculture, the whole idea, nothing is wrong with that. I'm into a Greek, and I know the challenges. So nothing is wrong with that. But the template, okay. the tool, the transmission mechanism, okay. that's where the problem was. Okay, prof. If, for example, Bank of, Industry, uh, uh, Bank of Agriculture had been threatened, had been enabled, had been empowered, they could have carried out that function on behalf of okay. Central Bank of Nigeria. Okay. I don't want to talk about the, the, the fiscal aspect. Okay. But uh, you know, like, like, like I said, the question will come, what is the position of the law? Whether we go left, right, and center, we will so, come back to that. What, okay. what is the law say? Okay, so, and the law is say completely a different thing from what happened. So okay. that's where we have the problem. So I want to take you on the position of the law at first, you know. What would be your explanation of the position okay. of the law as regards, you know, those fiscal things the CBN did do, those intervention? It was not only in agriculture that the current CBN president, uh, uh, CBN governor is now saying <coughs> that amounted to about 10 trillion that he couldn't understand. It also spans across even COVID-19 intervention and some other necessary funds. Number one, what's that? Secondly, let's also talk about 
the role of the president in all of this, if you check the CBN Act properly, the former CBN governor, Mefili, could not have done all the things he did without the say-so of the president. Because the way the law is couched in the CBN Act 2007, it still has to go through the president. Take, for instance, if you even want to take big decisions as regards to currency, it still has to go through the president. So why is everybody exonerating the president in all of this? Because it still comes to the leadership. Just like in this current administration, it was the president's wish that the currency should be floated, and it was that wish that prevailed. So the president, I dare say, is still the de facto CBN governor in the administration. What's your take on that, Prof? Because we know you have to run, sir. Thank you, moderator. Uh, like I said, with every uh, due sense of uh, responsibility, I'm also a member of the bar. And I am saying, when the ships are down, the question will be, what is the position of the law? I cannot see in that act where it says the president can overrule the central bank or the governor of central bank when it comes to this uh, ways and means. I cannot read it there. So it now becomes question of may and the leadership. Am I ready? For example, if you compute 5% of the previous year revenue, as at the time we were talking about this, my calculation was, I think, less than 1 trillion. And we're talking about 20 trillion ways and means. So how that happened, I don't want to go into that. But it is clear that that is a violation of the provision of the law. There, you see, there is an omnibus provision in that law, I think section 32, if I'm not mistaken which is the Central Bank of Nigeria can do all that is necessary to help the development of the economy. Then it becomes who I am as an individual. What can I do? What can I justify? First of all, to protect the system, to protect my person. So if I now say, okay, let me give 10 trillion to the system, in pursuing that, is that the most desirable? Given my skills and expertise, should I take, like I said, if I as, uh, uh, if I, let's say as leadership of a central bank, I am saying let's deal directly with farmers, with Nollywood, with manufacturers, with Afasia. Does the central bank have the capacity to see that through? Some of those who benefited from National Microfinance Bank loans, some of them will have thought that is the share of the national cake. Was that the intention? Well, prof. When we have over, at least over 200 microfinance banks, still, 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 uh, still kicking. So, Mr. Moderator, I don't think it will be good justification to say that, oh, I was put under pressure. Uh, it's because uh, uh, there were circumstances beyond uh, my control. Oh, it's because Mr. President said I should go ahead. I will be the one they will ask question from. Nobody will call on Mr. President. Because I also owe Mr. President Professor, that responsibility Professor of saying Ajibala. this is the position of the law. And this is Prof. my own advice. One of the functions of a central bank is to play advisory roles. So if I fail in my that duty of care, well, it's Prof. even a fiduciary responsibility. If Prof. I fail in that duty, Prof. I should also be ready to be accountable. Prof, your point is clear. Yes. I understand you have another engagement, but before you go, I'd like you to comment on the uh, Chartered Institute of Bankers at 60. You are a past president of the body, and in his prefatory remarks, uh, the uh, CBN governor talked about how this has been quite uh, a distinguished uh, body. Uh, we started in 1963, and which has been able to make a lot of difference in the banking industry. So tell us. Just a little briefly, because you are, I understand you have another appointment about the Chartered Institute of Bankers. Just reflect on it and what you think. So this, uh, Mr. Moderator, this is a very, this is a, this is a very critical uh, forum. So I don't mind spending more time if you, if you request of me. Uh, my people, yes, we are on a seminar with judges here. Okay. So they please, understand that I'm here, as yeah. I'm here now. So okay. if you have reason, to say less extent, I'm okay. Okay. Now, Chartered of Bankers of Nigeria, 
professional banking came to Nigeria in 1963 through the London uh, Institute of uh, uh, Bankers. And uh, for that 60 years, the Chartered Days of Bankers of Nigeria, in summary, has been the conscience of the banking industry and plays three critical roles. One is that of certification, which comes under education. And we have different categories of certification. We have our flagship certification, which is associate membership, ACIB. Then after a while, with your experience, with your contributions to the industry, to the economy, you move up to become fellow of the institute. And we have certification in so many other areas, even for microfinance bankers, even for risk managers. We have collaboration with so many other institutes, even with the Nigeria Bar Association and co. So that comes under certification. The second role is that of advocacy. As con the conscience of the industry, we advocate, we play the role, we, 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 we interact between the banking community and the leadership at various levels, executive, judiciary, and uh, uh, legislat legislative. Upon years upon years, we've been playing this role. We've been to the president, we've been to the leadership of National Assembly yesterday, just this yesterday, we were, the, we were with the chief uh, justice of uh, Nigeria, just trying to mediate between the banking community and other faces of our national life. The seminar we are now is what we call annual judges seminar, where we have top bankers and top judges interacting to be able to understand their own languages for, so that the judiciary will also be in a better state to understand some technicalities about banking. So we play that advocacy role. The third role is that of ethics and professionalism. Banking is a profession that values ethics, that values professionalism. If that is lost, everything is lost. Like somebody will say, if you have the capacity, if you have the ability, if you have what to do, and you don't have integrity to do it, forget about the rest. So the banking system must remain a system that values integrity and abhors unethical practices. And we have so many ways we play this. The Secretariat of the Chartered of Bankers of Nigeria serves as the, as the Secretariat for the <coughs> Bankers Committee, Subcommittee on Ethics and Professionalism, which is like an alternative resolution platform. And a lot, a lot has been done in resolving disputes between customers and their banks, between banks and banks, even staff and so on, running into billions upon billions of naira and millions upon millions of dollars. We have, is, we have a program which we call uh, ethics, uh, ethics certification, where as members of the industry, you have to sign into that certification so that you are judged, as lawyers will say, fit and proper to belong in the industry. And totally, we have a code of conduct for bankers, which immediately you join the system, you sign that code of conduct. You surrender yourself to the disciplinary process and procedure of the Chartered of Bankers of Nigeria through investigative panel, through disciplinary uh, uh, tribunal. So it's not, it's not business as usual. You must be prepared to be accountable for whatever you do in the industry. And part of the problem we have is some try to escape some of these things. So when they commit enormous crimes and so on and so forth in their respective uh, uh, seats and positions, there is no professional body that will hold them accountable. It's no longer the case. We hold you. We will put you through the general process. And we will, dis we will demand, we, uh, we demand you if you are found guilty. So when you put all this together, playing that role, especially in the recent past, playing all those roles, uh, I can say without any fear of contradiction, that Chartered of Bankers of Nigeria has made immense contribution to the development of the industry and by extension, the development of the economy in the last 60 years. So we thank uh, uh, 
the governor, Dr. Laiyemi Kadoso, for appreciating that fact and for asserting it that the Chartered of Bankers of Nigeria, as we have it today, is a body to reckon with when it comes to analyzing events, the dynamics of the banking industry, and the Nigeria economy as a whole. And we thank our leadership over the years. Well, thank you very for, much. For uh, making uh, the sacrifice thank to you make the Chartered of Bankers of Nigeria what it is today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ajibola, for joining us this morning on The Morning Show. Thank you very much.